My name is Ashley Ernst, and I am the current Women's Leadership Initiative Chair for this uh, United Way campaign year. So I'd like to take a minute to first welcome you all, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy days to be here with us. Um, I want to take a few minutes to also talk about Women's Leadership Initiative um, and really what we're all about. The whole premise behind what we do is we're trying to unite the, the power of women uh, to help other women here in our community for their, their health care. Um, we have done a United Way Needs Assessment and have realized that we have a large population of women, nearly 4,000, that are underinsured or uninsured in our community. So. With that, uh, Women's Leadership Initiative last year donated about $170,000 to these women. And uh, through Community Health Free Clinic, Lynn Community Care, and also uh, Lynn County Public Health. Uh, some of the services that we provide to these women are prescriptions, medical co-pays, medical supplies, eye exams, dental, uh, diabetic testing supplies, and every year we do a preventative health care screening for uh, women that are uninsured or underinsured, and we call that Well Women Week, and that's every April, so that's also where a lot of these dollars are going. We know that it obviously takes a team to make all of these things happen, so uh, our partnerships with Community Health Free Clinic, Lynn Community Care, and also Lynn County Public Health I know there are some representatives from those partnerships here today, so if you ladies wouldn't mind standing. Thank you so much for your partnership. We also would like to thank uh, the committee. Lisa Henderson is our vice chair, and she is here with us today among all of our other committee members. I can't thank you ladies enough for all your hard work. Please stand to be recognized. And finally, we obviously could not do this without our Sponsors, uh, Cedar Rapids Bank and Trust, Mercy Medical Center, Paulson Electric, and also PEC Communication. Thank you all for your support as well. And lastly, we can't forget the United Way staff. Thank you guys for everything. It is now my pleasure to uh, introduce to you today's speaker. We have Sandra Shaw Hardy here, who has helped inspire women donors in more than 50 universities, scores of health organizations, women business organizations, community foundations, United Ways, among many other. Her research has been quoted in both nas national and international media. Since 1995, she has authored, co-authored, or co-edited six books, including her newest book, Women and Philanthropy, Boldly Shaping a Better World, which is sitting at your table. The book received a 2011 National Award for Outstanding Public Published Scholarship from the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education. Along with Martha Taylor, Sandra co-founded the, Women, the Women's Philanthropy Institute, now a program at the Center of Philanthropy at Indiana University. The center awarded Sandra and Martha the first Shaw Hardy Taylor Achievement Award for extraordinary contributions to moving women's philanthropy forward in 2008. After forming one of the first giving circles in the nation in Traverse City, Michigan, Sandra's dream was that every city in the U.S. have a women's giving circle. Some 10 years later, these giving circles number in the hundreds, and Sandra has helped initiate scores of them. She's often been referred to as the mother of giving circles. Sandra is here today to talk to us about women in philanthropy, gender, generations, and generosity. Please help me welcome Sandra Shaw Hardy. Thank you, Ashley. It's a delight to be here. I've never been to your lovely city before, and I'm totally charmed. It's a, it's a beautiful place, and I guess I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> but what really amazed me was landing in the airplane yesterday. I live in Traverse City, Michigan, which, you know, if you look at the state of Michigan, it's, it's a myth. And this is like Michigan, and I live way up here. It's a resort area. 
And, but landing, I've never seen so much corn, <laughs> ever. But it is a lovely place and you've taken very good care of me and I'm delighted to be here. Because women like you are gathering really all over the world to celebrate women in philanthropy, to encourage women in philanthropy, and to change the face Change the face of philanthropy from this to this. This is a, a picture of Pleasant Roland Frouchy, who I'm sure there's hardly anybody in the room who doesn't know what an American doll is, either because you had them or you bought them or you were given them. But Pleasant was the one who came up for, with the concept of American girl dolls. And she says that in the past two decades, the single largest change in philanthropy is the emergence of women philanthropists. Incidentally, she sold her company to Mattel for $120 million. But you don't have to be a pleasant frouchy to be a philanthropist. Osceola, the late Osceola McCarty is an inspiration to all of us. Osceola was a laundress in Mississippi for over 70 years, and she saved all of her savings and gave it in a $150,000 scholarship to the University of Southern Mississippi for scholarships to help students have a better life than she did. She truly is an inspiration to all of us. So why is women's philanthropy so important? Well, Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General says, when women are fully involved, the benefits can be seen immediately. Families are healthier, they're better fed, their income, savings, and reinvestment go up. And what is true of families is true of communities and eventually of whole countries. Women's perspective and voices must be brought to the forefront. Our perspective as women is formed by our life experiences as mothers, grandmothers, aunts, sisters, community leaders, workers. We offer a vital perspective on the world's problems and we are closest to societal needs. We know what the solutions should be and we have the power to bring about those solutions. You in, oh, okay. you in this room are the women that the Dalai Lama was talking about at a recent Vancouver Peace Conference. He was on a panel with the woman who, was, who had been the president of Ireland and, and head of the peace movement there, and four uh, Nobel Prize winners who were also um, women who were against landmines. And after the conference, he said, based on his experience, the world will be saved by Western women. We Western women are so fortunate because over the last 90 years, we have come from this. How many of you watched Downton Abbey? Don't you just love it? <laughs> Can you just hardly wait for it to begin again? And see Shirley MacLaine as Lady Cora's mother. Oh. If you <laughs> if you haven't watched it, you must catch up because it's just a wonderful show. Well, Lady Mary Crowley is shown here, and when she was asked by her male cousin if her life was proving satisfactory, she responded, "Women like me don't have a life. We choose clothes, take calls, and do the season." But really, we're stuck in a waiting room until we marry. He says, I'm sorry I've made you angry. And she replies, my life makes me angry, not you. Today, there is no waiting. There are no waiting rooms. Women have choices unheard of even some 30 years ago. 30 years ago, uh, we had no women justice uh, Supreme Court. 
There were no altar girls. There were no little league girls. In fact, only one in 27 girls played sports. And I was recounting this to another group last, last week, and I said, when I played basketball in junior high school, I could only use half the court. <laughs> Most Wall Street law and brokerage firms had never had a female partner. Most hospitals did not have a female surgical resident. There were 12 women in the U.S. House of Representatives. There were no women senators, and there were no women governors. Could any of us have imagined how different things would be? How the things that we now take for granted, like women police officers and firefighters, senators, Supreme Court justices, governors and attorney generals, partners, surgeons, and CEOs. Girls can do anything that men can. Maybe sometime we'll even have a woman president. Women can do anything that men can. We can become philanthropists if we aren't one already, or we could give more. I'm time with this. Because not only do we have the choices, but we also have the means that we never had before. Women own over 50% of the nation's wealth. We are enrolled in colleges and universities at greater rates than men. In fact, our incomes are rising faster than men's. We are taking control of our finances, whether earned, married, or inherited, which is the first thing that we have to do. You have to have control of your finances before you can become a philanthropist. There's a huge intergenerational transfer of wealth that's going to take place over the next 20 to 40 years, they're not specific about it, of about $41 trillion. And we outlive men by five to seven years. In fact, about 90% of all women will be single at some point in their lives. And recent research shows that single women give more in all categories than single men. We have the means to give as never before. But you know, women have always given. It's just that we really didn't know about it. And even if the uh, institutions they began became valuable, like the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York City, once Andrew Carnegie gave them valuable tapestries, the men said, oh, it's too much money for the woman to, to manage, and so they took over. So we really haven't known about a lot of it. My favorite story, actually, about women giving, all women giving, is Mary Elizabeth Garrett. It was the late 1800s, and Johns Hopkins University was wanting to complete their medical school and they still needed $350,000. So they went to Mary Elizabeth and they asked her for the money. And she said she'd think about it. And she thought about it and she said, okay, you can have the money, but there's two conditions. One, you have to admit women. And secondly, and this is really important when you think about it, they have to study the same courses as the men. Well, Johns Hopkins got their money, and the first class had 20% women graduates. And what I really like about that is that, besides the fact that she leveraged her money, is that she gave it during her lifetime. In fact, Ann Landers says, the late Ann Landers, give, give your, do your giving while you're living so you'll be knowing where it's going. <laughs> when Martha Taylor and I started talking about women's philanthropy over 20 years ago, we wanted to know what motivates women to give, and so we had two focus groups, and one of them were baby boomer women, her generation, and the other one were what I call my generation, prime time women. <laughs> and we found out that, in fact, the reasons that women give 
were the same no matter what generation. So we called it the six C's of women's giving. <clears throat> Women give to create something in response to a human need. And I wanted to interject here something that that Michelle told me about. Because here is an example in your own community of Kids First Law and Jenny Schultz. Do you all know about this? Yeah. Is Jenny here? Oh, I wish she was. I'd like to be here. Anyway, she saw a problem and created something. So congratulations. Sounds great. I, I want to know more about it. Women want to change society for the better. They want to give out of a commitment to the organization's mission. Does all this sound familiar? They want to connect to the causes they care about. They want to be able to volunteer and be part of. They want to collaborate. They want to get together as women, do things together. And finally, they want to celebrate. They want to celebrate others' giving, and they want to celebrate their own giving. People often ask me how Martha and I became interested in women's philanthropy. Martha is still a vice president for the University of Wisconsin Foundation. And she noted back in 1988 that women were not giving to their universities in the same numbers as they were represented as students or alums. And she, so she wondered why. And that's when we started doing our, our research. But she also started the first women's philanthropy initiative at a public university in the nation in 1988. Um, 23 years ago then, we started what is now the Women's Philanthropy Institute at the Center on Philanthropy at Indiana University. And this is a photo of Deborah Mesh, who is the executive director of the um, Women's Philanthropy Institute. And what happened really was we, we felt like we had birthed the baby, and now our baby has gone to college and is doing research because the kind of research that Martha and I did were interviews, focus groups, what they call qualitative research, and now has grown up and is doing quantitative research. And that says that by understanding the nature of women's philanthropy through research and translation, more women will understand themselves as philanthropists. And this understanding will impact men as well as they know how over 50% of the population is giving. We're not talking about small change, says Deborah. We're talking about making world change. Uh, the Center on Philanthropy and the Women's Philanthropy Institute since, 19, or since 2010 have been coming out with reports like this called uh, Women Give, so it's a Women Give 2010, 2011, 2012, and they've been collaborating with financial institutions. And some of the research has shown that women are more nurturing and caring than men in their giving. That women are concerned with those less fortunate, and they're concerned about health care. Some of the other factors affecting women's giving are how women's parents handle money and their relationship with their father. Whether a woman's money comes from being earned, inherited, married, or even nowadays we're talking about divorced. But the biggest factor may be generational. So we're going to look at some generations and see if you see yourselves in these. But understand that these are generalizations, so there will be exceptions. Okay, first of all, my generation. The prime time generation, impacted by <coughs> World War II and women's liberation. We're the first generation to really experience divorce. Now, we've been called the quiet generation, but if you look at some of those pictures up there, it's hardly uh, fair to say that you see a lot of quiet women up there, right? You see Gloria Stein and Barbara Walters, Martha Stewart, Diane Sawyer, Nancy Pelosi, and Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader. So we haven't always been quiet. We invented ourselves. We had no role models. 
We know what we want out of life, but it's still a wonderful journey. We support younger women because we want things better for them than they were for us. Education and health are very important. Education because we were often the first ones in our family to <coughs> college, and health because we are taking care of our elderly parents. We mostly give with our spouse, but some give independently. And now, the biggest, best educated, largest generation in the history of the world, baby boomer. How many of you in the room are baby boomers? Raise your hand. You notice I didn't ask how many were crying. <laughs> we were impacted by civil rights, the Vietnam War, Kennedy and King murders. It's, it's a reflective time in your life because uh, most of your family are gone. And children. You want change through your giving. In fact, you've always been clamoring for change. Think about the 60s. World peace is important because you grew up watching television in Vietnam and people being killed. You demand trust, respect, and Im impact from your giving. You're the first generation to put nonprofits on the line and tell them, we want you to be accountable. This is a picture of my dear good friend, co-author, colleague, Martha Taylor. I told you she started the first women's philanthropy initiative at a public university and has been really one of the major leaders in the modern women's philanthropy movement. And then there's Gen X, born between 1965 and 77. Raise your hand, Gen X. A lot. A lot of you. Daughters of a revolution, if you think about your mothers being the revolutionaries. Children of divorce and financial upheaval. You women earn and give your own money. You've grown up with diversity and you expect it to be present in the organizations that you support. Your time, of course, is very crucial. And social networking is extremely important to you. You give in your community, but you understand the relationship between local and global issues, and you're poised to give globally. The photo up here is Buffy Bodo and Schwartz, um, another co-author of our new book. Buffy lives in the Baltimore area and has started 20 uh, giving circles there in the area. She's also on the foundation board for Howard County, and she has four children. So she knows how crucial time is. And last, Jen Y. Millennials, born between 1978 and 1999. Raise your hand. Oh, this is great to have so many. The other day when I was giving a presentation to a much smaller audience than this, we would have had to have gone out in the kitchen and gotten the waitresses. <laughs> that tells you the age of the group. <laughs> um, you want to find a better balance in life than your mother's between your working and your family and your personal life. Social networking is, of course, extremely important, as we talked about last night with Ashley. You want to create a better world, and you realize that the world is one giant community and that we are citizens of the world. Jane Addams once said, I'm a resident of Chicago, but I'm a citizen of the world. And you see a big link between local and global issues. You start your philanthropy early. We did some research a couple of years ago, and it was amazing this generation expected to be or considered themselves as philanthropists. That was not a scary term to them. The picture up there is one that I just put up last week of Barbara Arandondo from Monterey, uh, Mexico. Um, Barbara was concerned because I don't know how many of you know about Monterey. It used to be the safest city. It's about four million in Latin America until the drug cartels came in in 2010. And about 60,000 people have been killed as a result of the drug cartels. Not all in Monterey, but a lot of them. 
And she decided that she was tired of staying in, inside and being afraid. So she decided to hold a peace conference in, of all places, one of the most unpeaceful places in the world. And she invited the likes of Dalai Lama and others. 6,000 people came. This was in 2011, including the Dalai Lama. And it was to talk about how to bring peace to the world. She just recently, in August, had a conference of 300 women to talk about the unique qualities that women bring and how those qualities can be captured. I don't like the word captured, that's, that's, that's a military term or something. But anyway, can be used to, to have peace. And the third reason why I'm really interested in Barbara is because my grand granddaughter, whose father is Mexican, goes to school in Monterey. She's in medical school there in her third year. And her mother and I are going the end of October to see her. And I am so hoping that I get to meet Barbara Arandondo. And I encourage you to look her up on the internet. She, she really now is fearless. And she's the kind of woman in that generation who just, they just go ahead and do things because they see what needs to be done and they just do it. So women are leading and transforming philanthropy. When you look at the number of, for example, university initiatives like the one Martha started, there are over a hundred of them now. There are hundreds and hundreds of women's giving circles. And by giving circles, I mean like, like yours, where women pool their money and decide where it's going to be given. Um, there are women's funds. There are about 150 women's funds worldwide with assets of $500 million. And that's to help women and girls. Women are starting family foundations. Women's philanthropy is growing into a global movement in places like Ghana, <coughs> Australia, Great Britain. But perhaps the most heart warming and amazing is that in 1995, Martha and I wrote a book called Reinventing Fundraising, Realizing the Potential of Women's Philanthropy. And we said at that time that men's philanthropy was going to become more like women's philanthropy. And truly, it, it is becoming more like women's philanthropy. It's been over 20 years that Martha and I have been studying, researching, presenting to and talking with women donors. We have seen the change in women as they've discovered their values and found their voices. And their voices are now expressed both verbally and financially. Women are now saying, yes, I am a philanthropist. Women are becoming philanthropic leaders by, as pleasant Roland Fauci said, becoming philanthropists, using creative approaches like Barbara Arandondo, not afraid of failure, trying new ways to address old issues, and engaging others to give with them, like your Women's Leadership Initiative. Oh, I should go back. That's a picture of Tracy Gary, who started the first women's fund in the Bay Area in, in San Francisco in 1975. She was an heiress to uh, Quaker, Quaker Oats. You have Quaker Oats here? Yeah. Okay. And um, what got her started with women's funds was because she would go to meetings, she was 21 at the time, with other women and men, and she found out that the women did not speak much at the meetings. So she wanted to organize groups of women, and then women to help women and girls. And she has started about 25 nonprofits. She's really been the leader in the, in the modern women's philanthropy movement. But you also have, of course, your women here in Cedar Rapids, many of them. But here are two. Uh, Lydia Brown, is Lydia here? Hi, Lydia. <laughs> <laughs> women leading capital campaigns like Lydia. And Terry Christofferson, is Terry here? Well, there she is, right in front of me. And I like some, yes. I like the fact that, that Terry responded to, um, let's see, what, a passion for the cause. 
But that's what women want. They, the cause comes first. With many men, it who does, it's who does the asking and then the cause. With women, it's the cause. And I love it because um, Lydia is taking the steps to get out there and ask people to give and give herself. So congratulations to both of you. You are truly role models for us. Women are making a difference by being bold and audacious in their giving. How many of you know of Helen and Swanee Hunt? A few of you. Well, their father was H.L. Uh, Hunt from Texas. And he was an oil billionaire. And he had three families. And they happened to be in his last family, but he did not marry their mother until after they were born. Um, he had 14 children, and somehow his two daughters, Helen and Swanee, grew up to use their financial power to support the powerless and to encourage peace and women's leadership throughout the world. In 2007, they started a campaign called Women Moving Millions because women hadn't been asked for huge gifts of a million dollars. And their goal was to raise 150 million. They started out by giving a 10 million dollar um, gift themselves, and the the uh, campaign concluded three years later in 2010, having raised 200 million from 150 donors of a million dollars or more. The Women Moving Millions campaign, and it was for women's funds throughout the nation. Women are influencing philanthropy through their families and their spouses. This, of course, is Melinda and Bill Gates. And there was an article in Fortune magazine in 2008 about uh, Bill Gates and about uh, Warren Buffett. And Bill Gates said about his philanthropy, I don't think it would be as much fun to do on my own without Melinda. And I don't think I'd do as much of it. Warren Buffett believes that Melinda makes Bill a better decision maker. He's smart as hell, obviously, but in terms of seeing the whole picture, she's smart. <clears throat> Would Buffett have given the Gates Foundation his fortune if Melinda were not in the picture? That's a great question, he responds, and the answer is, I'm not sure. Women are becoming donor divas, like Cheryl Womack. She gave $2 million to help build the Kansas University's women's softball team park. In 1981, Cheryl founded an insurance group, BCW, and the National Association of Independent Trucks. She's the third of 11 children, the daughter of a Panamanian immigrant, who, who she says her father encouraged her with an attitude that helped her envision the world on my plate. See how, how important father's attitudes are as far as their daughters go? She started her business in her basement and says, I didn't even know how to read a financial statement. When asked how she funded herself, she said, well, my husband certainly paid for me to live. Actually, that's not true. I left that husband. <laughs> I was just on a roll to change my life. What can I say? I left that husband, went to work with my sister, or lived with my sister for three months, and then I got an apartment. I was making about 17000 a year. I dated to eat, which is something you could do back then. <laughs> and if they wanted more than dinner, I'd pay for the dinner myself. <laughs> She sold her company in 2002. It had become a $100 million a year business. And you know what VCW stands for? Very cute women. <laughs> so women are leading the way in global giving. I can't read, wait to read a new book that just came out this week. It's called Grandmother Power, A Global Phenomenon by author and photographer Paola Jen Turco. And it profiles activist grandmothers in 15 countries using their power to fight for a better future for their grandchildren everywhere. And I urge you all to think about getting that book. 
The pictures, the photographs are just marvelous and such wonderful stories. Women are changing the world and making a difference by working intergenerationally. It's wonderful about women's groups like this that there are so many generations in here. Every time I would say, are you in that generation, there were many numbers of you that would raise your hand. And there's nothing like the thrill that one gets to be in a room with women of all ages who care about making a difference in their lives and making a difference in others' lives. So as a result of what is happening, we've come up with three new seats about women's giving. Women are taking control of their finances and thus of their lives. Women have the confidence to give to causes they care about and the courage to try new ways of addressing old problems. Women are expressing and sharing their values through their philanthropy. And I have looked for the past over 20 years for a definition of philanthropy that I thought really fit. And I love this one from Ellen Gold, uh, Gold, Goodman. Um, she says, philanthropy is the one voluntary decision, voluntary economic decision we make in everyday life that offers us a chance to put our vision and our values, our money, and our morals in the right place. Isn't that a great definition? And we can do just that. We can put our vision and our values, our money and our morals in the right place by using our power of the purse. Our purses give us an enormous advantage to insist that there be certain outcomes to bring about transformational change that will do more than just put band-aids on problems. I'd like to tell you a story that Jill Banger Burns shared with a group of women in Rockford, Illinois, uh, who were there for a united way. They gathered together to celebrate women's philanthropy. And this is the story of her yellow purse. She was the woman behind the, uh, the, the catalyst behind the fledgling organization. And when she turned to speak, and I happened to be there as, as, as a speaker, she had a pedestal. And on that pedestal was a great big yellow purse. <laughs> Actually, it was fancier than that. Um, she said, I bought the purse last summer because I really wanted it. It was kind of expensive. I didn't need it, and to be honest, I carried it for about a week, and I realized it was really too big, too heavy, and doesn't go with much. And since then, it's been on a closet in my bedroom. She went on to say, I keep it there for a reason. To me, it's become a symbol of all I have and all I have are the things I don't need. It's a symbol of the material possessions that I have purchased that I could really live without. In fact, she says, I bet we all have that purse, that pair of shoes, that coat, or that piece of jewelry. When I open my closet each day, I see the purse, and I'm reminded of the things I've spent money on and regretted later. I'm also reminded that I've never regretted any money I've given to nonprofits. I know that each time I give, the nonprofit is helping someone who needs something much more important than a big, heavy, yellow purse. That purse has real power. She concluded by saying, I ask all of you today to change the power of the purse from the negative to the positive. Let's remember that we can be the most generous person we know with just what we have. Author and professor Claire Gaudiani holds out a challenge to all of us. She says, American women are living the best and healthiest lives that any women have ever lived at any time, anywhere. We are the generations of women the world has been waiting for. And we should do more to make up for the good life. 
for what previous generations had done to make our lives what they are. And Nobel Peace Prize winner Archbishop Desmond Tutu tells us how to meet Claire's challenge. He says, women, you have a special way of reaching out to others. You must start a revolution. You must turn the world into a place you want, a world of compassion, gentleness, and caring. Creating your Women's Leadership Initiative was a revolutionary act six years ago. When you started the WLI, you knew the importance of women taking control of their finances. You had the confidence to look at your values and to look at this as a new way to raise and give away money. One based on the fact that women have the money, women care, and they do want to do something together. And today, we celebrate that revolutionary act, the creation of the Women's Leadership Initiative. We celebrate what we as women can and must do to express our values with our philanthropy. Our generations of women know what the solutions are and what they should be. We know how we can make a difference. And you could make a difference right here in this room, in your community, by joining together and supporting the Women's Leadership Initiative. Because, as Sojourner Truth said, if one woman in the Garden of Eden can turn this world upside down all alone, <laughs> women together ought to be able to turn it right side up again. <laughs> Congratulations for all you have done and are doing to make this the age of women's philanthropy. Understanding that women make the choices in health care, and when women take, care, take control of their health, they take control of their lives. And healthy women mean a healthy community. By involving more women in your community through the Women's Leadership Initiative, you are helping shape and direct the future of women's health care. Slightly revising Mahatma Gandhi's words, we must make the difference we want to see. Our generations of women know what the solution should be. We know we can make a difference. Because we are the generations of women the world has been waiting for. We hold the world in our hand, hands and in our hearts. Things have never been so good for us, nor has the world needed us more. But I am confident through the gifts that we have by being women and using our financial gifts, we will meet the challenge. And our communities and our world will be better for future generations. Women like you in this room are my inspiration. You reflect and support my passion. In partnership, we women will change the world. No other group of people will have the profound impact on the world that we will have in the coming years. Congratulations on all you are doing, and my very best wishes to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. I think we all have a lot that we can take away from her today. So one more round of applause for Sandra Grace. <laughs> Currently, our Women's Leadership Initiative is at 314 members, and which is around $190,000. We've set our goal for this year, and I'm very proud to announce that our goal is 340 members and nearly $205,000 this year. We need your help in, of course, making this goal happen and providing the funds that are needed for women in our community. To join our Women's Leadership Circle, a $500, $500 designation is needed. You can join by making a gift today or also through your workplace campaigns that are taking place. The steering committee members and staff at the door have Women's Leadership reusable bags 
and with all the details for all that, and you'll recognize them because they all have Women's Leadership Initiative stickers on. Uh, another great reason to get involved is we have our Power of the Purse event, uh, and we're going to start doing that every other year. So mark your calendars for late summer of 2013. Uh, and if you're not already signed up to be a women's leader, there is a sign-up table uh, over in the North Fork. So be sure to put your email and, and things in that to get that. Uh, finally, we'd of course like to give a special thanks to those of us who've helped put together the gift bags that are on your table today. Uh, Debbie Newmeyer is the Simply Perfect Printing, Clicks Photography, Bowtime Basket, and Raining Rose. If you look at the bottom of your bag, one person at each table has a sticker, and that person gets to take home Sandra's book. Once again, ladies, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules today to join us. And one more round of applause for Sandra. Mm -hmm.